maybe you can give an assessment on Singapore as a whole, uh, public, private, as well as academic, and so on. Uh, whether we are, in a way, well organized enough to take advantage of that, that huge opportunity available overseas? Well, well, we did a project in Batam. I used uh, Singapore Technologies and some whatever. It was purely, it's government owned, but it's privately managed. I bought expertise from uh, different government departments from here and there, but it was purely a commercial arrangement. But as we start work on Sucho, we become more and more government. Because what they want is not just hardware, but the way we manage Singapore, we run Singapore, administer Singapore. So a lot of requests are not just hardware, but also the software doing things. So as you go on to overseas project, people, any architect can design and build the keys. What makes a place tick? So it's the policies, uh, practices, procedures, uh, government regulations that make it work. So a lot of countries come to us for help, not so much as the physical facility, which the architect can do for them. How do you run Singapore? So in a sense, we are a little small model for them because we are less than 5 million. Most of the cities they have are much bigger. So I think we have an advantage because we are compact, we are diverse, we are a global city. And the key is that that is an advantage for us. We cannot compete with Shanghai or Beijing, but we can help cities of 5 million, 6 million. Uh, that's a reasonable size to live in. Any city over 10 million is humongous. Uh, any city 5 is a good size city. What called second tier cities. Okay, can I have the next question, please? Hi, my name is George. I'm from PUB. Uh, Mr. Yeo, your successes and contributions to Singapore has been legendary. Uh, are there certain endeavors, certain projects that did not uh, proceed as well as you had hoped for? And are there lessons to be learned from these endeavors? Uh, well, George Yeo somewhat gave an interview once, and when Phil Yeo starts a project, you better stay away from him. Because I will not tolerate uh, opposition. I just roll over there. No, every project had a problem. When I proposed Jurong Island, the greatest opponent was GTC. Why should I reclaim island? There's no customer. There's nobody coming. I said, well, you don't claim I cannot promote the island of Jurong Island. So I went to the minister. Now the prime minister says, can I have a change of leadership in GTC? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I cannot work with a bunch of people who refuse to work with me. So he said, okay, you, I leave it to you. So I managed to convince Wong Hang Kim to be chairman. And then... Uh, Got David Lim back from New York, four years to be CEO, and we start moving. So the key is that you should not be blocked by opposition. If you really believe what you are doing, after all, there's no personal benefit for me to Jurong Island. This is what you will call white elephant. It was in Doctor Go. By the way, Jurong Town was only about one thousand hectares. I'm proposing a three thousand hectare island, three thousand four to be precise, with no customers under the sea. So it was a crazy idea. But if I want to build a chemical industry, there's no land in Singapore. The only piece of land was uh, in Jurong and the sterilized housing, sterilized housing. There was no choice. So when I did it, there was no opposition. Uh, fortunately for the Prime Minister, he, had, he thought, okay, you can do it. Uh, and that's just it. So I asked for a change of leadership and we did it. So the key is that if you want to do anything, prepare to take opposition and roll over them. <laughs> Next question, please. Please. Hello, Mr. Yeo. Sorry I'm in my field gear. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you made a very... Sorry? The most casual dress. <laughs> um, it, it's very interesting you made the remark, 10 million, uh, cities of 10 million in size. Too big, too big. Uh, and 5 million, the second tier group. Better size, I suppose. But I suppose then again, it depends on the size of the city because it's not just the absolute value itself. So for Singapore, is 5 million too big given our small size? And if you want quality of life, how do we actually calculate the optimum population where we would still have, we would still have quality of life, uh, a good, you know, uh, um, a, a, and, and good economy, because we depend on knowledge economy rather than just industries. Thank you. Well, we have 60,000 hectares of land, 66,000. JTC has about 10, 11,000. Mindia have about 10, 11,000. Let's say they're 40. There's only 40,000 hectares of land, less industry, less Mindia. And of which we are trying to keep 50% green. 
is trading at SAF trading area. So we are land scared. So which means we got only 30,000 hectares of land that we can build up. But factories are always low, plot ratio. So from my point of view, we have actually 30,000 hectares of land that we can do high, as high as we can. It's how we design the, the facilities that everything is integrated. I mean, Fisher Police example, is living almost a city. When it's fully occupied with the site we're running now, there's no reason for the building to not take 5,000 people. Absolutely no problem. Yeah? With the next phase 2A and spring, the whole planning for one north is 100,000 people based on 200 hectares of land. So it's not how many people can take, it's how do you design the facilities that people don't have to run around from building to building, space to space. You make it as compact as possible. It's almost like, uh, if you go to a beehive, how many bees are there in a the hive? It's all compact. So the key is that you want a city that's livable, but transport, you see, more, if you live in a, if you work in a high-rise building, most people know the people on top, people below. Beyond the fourth, or below the fourth floor, people don't interact. If you want to interact socially, network-wise, you want them to build literally in clusters. So the key is that the, the high-rise building also facilitate, but you must also force, uh, for example, when I build an office, I don't allow them to have coffee corners, put everything away, so they're forced to go to one corner. Because once they sit in the cubicle, they don't want to move. That's one of the problems of, of they have a good paper written, who are the social network? It's always around the people nearby. So if you build them compactly, I mean, you go to science part one, two, and three, which is a disaster in building design. The buildings all stand alone, nobody talks to each other. No one goes beyond, I say, huh? So when I told NSTV in 2000, 2000, I said, this is a crazy idea. Whose idea, where to get this plan? Oh, this is Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, nice weather, cool, don't get cooked. I mean, why you want to do this? I went to, uh, when I went to uh, southern uh, Sweden, winter, all the buildings are connected. Why? You get freeze your butt going outside. So all the buildings are compact. So I said, the idea is to build it compact. I don't want to go out, it's almost living in the... A cocoon. So, for Singapore point of view, beyond a human population, you must design a building in such a way that it's almost like living cities, cluster of living cities, and it can be done. In fact, the more new buildings, uh, you go to the Middle East, a lot of high-rise buildings, literally very compact, shops, restaurants, barbers, everything in there. It's almost a little beehive, modern beehive. That's what a city could be. Population, I don't know. I just, for Singapore, we don't have many babies. We have to borrow. So for us, it's not whether we want to grow. It's how can we grow. Okay? So population size and beyond me. <laughs> Please. Uh, Lika Chiang from uh, RSP. Um, so you, um, you have given us an example of the Bangalore Park, uh, IT Park, which uh, of course we are fortunate to have uh, learned from you a lot working on it. Oh, yes, I so I make money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but you have moved on since, of course, to do a lot of uh, uh, IT parks in, uh, in China, in Wuxi, in uh, Suzhou, and now we know they're moving on to Knowledge City. Um, can you share with us your insight and assessment of these two giants? I mean, I think a lot of Singapore developers, consultants, still going, looking to these two countries and so on. Uh, yeah, so, what, yeah, so what, what is your assessment for, I think, advice for consultants and investors, looking at these two giants, I mean, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and uh, how do I, we... I am involved in Singbridge for the last two years with John there. I just got me to join the board. My view is China, you have to look at second-tier cities, or West, the big cities, Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin, Tianjin doesn't need you. I mean, they are all new cities they're creating. In China, the biggest challenge you have is land. And there, uh, today, the government has a lot of issues with the local people. Because land are actually farmland taken over. So that's a big challenge. In India, there's a lot of raw land. But the difficulty is that India is that everything you have to do yourself. In China, you want to build an industrial park, the government do everything for you. Build the roads, build the highway, everything connected. In India, you're on your own. The good thing about India is that the law is English. I can argue with them. Uh, my land title is per in perpetuity, no problem. And they don't build an industrial park or township next door compete with me. The Indians are not very capable of that. <laughs> So if I look between China and India, uh, India is no competitor. In Bangalore IT Park, I have no boy next to me. In China, there will be four or five parks around me. So these are the plus and minus. So between the two, I like to go to a place where I can be left alone for a while. And advantage is India. On the other hand, India is a big challenge because everything you have to do yourself. So there are plus and minus. Uh, 